And when I told them how beautiful you are, they didn't believe me. They didn't believe me. Your lips, your eyes, your cheeks, your hair are in a class beyond compare. You're the loveliest girl that one could see. And when I tell them, and I'm certainly going to tell them that I'm the man whose wife one day you'll be, they'll never believe me. They'll never believe me that from this great big world you've chosen me. Mr. E. Huggins, real one. When and where were you born, Mr. Huggins? I was born on the 5th of July, 1895, in the village of Gisson, in a public, in a house next door to a public house, Gisson Crown. I'm seven years old. My family descend on Great Uncle Edgar's bungalow for Sunday lunch. I'm a small child. Adults talk, blah, blah, blah. I get bored. Not being allowed to leave the table, I amuse myself with a piece of string I have in my pocket. I tie slip knots along the string, pull them out, and then start again, trying to beat the previous number. After a good 15 minutes, Great Uncle Edgar leans over and quietly says, Well, you wouldn't have got bored in the trenches. What does he mean? He explains the extreme boredom of the long hours spent on watch in the trenches on the Western Front. You were in a war? Aye, First World War. He talks, I sit, and I listen. That afternoon has stayed with me ever since. My clearest memory is his big finish. He lifts up his shirt and reveals a huge scar, twisted and folded in on itself. I just stare in horrified wonder. I'm seven. I was born in a small house with two bedrooms, a downstairs room and a kitchen and pantry. It had black oak beams and a circled staircase. Years later, after Edgar's passed away, I'm sat in history class, learning numbers, dates, grand troop movements. That scar flashes into my head. Where's Edgar in all this? Many memories of that Sunday lunch have faded, but the scar remains. I want to know more about Edgar's story, but how? He's gone. After I was six months old, my father took a job as ganger on the railway in a village called Burston about two miles away. Years later, again, after leaving drama school and determined to do something with Edgar's story, I discover that before he died, the Imperial War Museum recorded his account. They realise that veterans of the Great War are dying out fast, and soon that world-changing event will be lost to living memory. So they send out researchers armed with tape decks and <clears throat> terrible microphones to record their voices before it's too late. Of the 6th Battalion, 151st Durham Light Infantry Brigade, Edgar's is the last voice. And him and mother moved out of that house into a railway house to take his job up, of, uh, looking after four miles of railway with three men. I finally get my hands on this interview, and I listen with ghoulish anticipation of stories of battles and bloodshed. But there aren't any. Edgar's account is vague and even a bit evasive. But why? I think back to that scar and I feel, I sense, I know there is a significant part of Edgar's story still untold. So I do my own research using military records, academic books, soldiers' accounts, and what I discover changes my understanding of everything. Edgar's human account and the empirical evidence do align, but sometimes he strays away. 
This is behaviour I recognise from character work we'd done at drama school, where often the most interesting things about a character are hidden in the subtext and the things they don't say. So, using these accounts, tools, documents, I'm going to try and give you as honest an account as I can of Edgar's story. At five-year-old, I had to start school, and the young lady that took me there, they called her Daisy Watland. And she took me to school and come and brought me home for mother. I had curls at five-year-old down onto my shoulders. And I was coming home from school one afternoon, and the cook from the rectory was outside in the road, and she said, I was very much like one of those long curls for my book, put in my book. And I said, you can't get a one. And Edgar runs home and tells his mother she has to cut all his long golden curls off. So it seems Edgar's very self-possessed, even at the age of five. 1908. Edgar's 13. He's sitting in the house when he overhears his father and mother talking. Money's getting a bit hard, Arthur. Well, there are six of them now. There's Edgar, his two brothers, his sister, his mum and his dad. So Edgar wants to help. He goes to school and asks Mr Sutton if he can leave. No, you can't leave school till you're 14. What do you want to leave school for anyway? Mother says money's getting hard, sir. Well, the only other way you can leave is to pass a grammar school examination. Can I set it one? You think I can pass? Yes, I think you can. I'll inquire. And at the end of that year, Edgar sits his examination and passes EX. That was excellent. That year, he starts work for Mr Carter on the farm for two shillings a week. And on the Saturday at five o'clock, when he gets his first pay, he runs home and shows it to his mum. And I says to mum, I says, hear me pay, mum. And I can see my mum's face now, how it lit up, as if somebody had given her a fortune. And she just turned and says, what a lot of little things that I want in this house now. And she meant food and things like that I can get. It's while on the farm that Edgar discovers he has a passion for working with horses. And by the time he's only 15, he's already breaking them in for Mr Carter to sell to hackney carriages in London. So it's also around this time that Edgar starts to think about Australia. But uh, my idea then was Australia. That's where I was wanting to go as a boy, young man. I've been used to breaking horses and such as that, you know. And I was horse mad. And he sets his heart on riding horses in the wild outback and working the ranches of Australia. So when he overhears an old farmer, Mr Rains, say his head horseman's wound up in prison after smacking a horse so hard he's taken its eye out, Edgar spots his chance and pipes up. Well, you want a horseman then? Oh, you want to be a horseman, do you? I said I might do. I don't know. You'd have to come all the way up to Durham. Better see what your father says. So Dad says... Well, he said the boy wanted to go, saying go. There's one thing, his home is always there if he's not satisfied. All right, I'll give him a trial. Here's a scythe, open 20 acre of wheat out. Now, 20 acres, if you're wondering, is about 800 by 1,000 feet. That's roughly 81,000 square feet. That is one hell of a trial. But Edgar does it because he knows with every swing of that scythe he's one step closer to Australia. You see, my ambition was to go to Australia on the ranches. And after I got the chance of a job up here, which bettered my position, and I thought that was a benefit. Eventually, though, Edgar leaves the farm and goes to work in the coal pits instead. The pits still use horses and mules, so it's not much of a stretch to see why a good horseman would be able to find decent work. And the pay is better. I left the farm and went to go and join the pits. And I joined the pits and I was joined the town in January 1940. Yes, that's the time when I joined. There was four or five of us lads out of Shildon went down and joined. So Edgar and four or five lads from Shildon joined the Terriers, or Territorial Army, in January 1914, with no clue that war is due in eight months. Now, when Edgar joins the Terriers, his skills as a horseman are quickly recognised. And the colour sergeant, who has to find grooms and servants for the officers, approaches Edgar and says... I think he said, you're used to uh, horses? I said, yes. He said, would you like to be Captain Jeffrey's groom? 
I said, oh, he said, take away, there's a lot more work attached to that. Oh, no, he said, there's no parade. He said, yeah, sure, it's all parade. Oh, I said, I'll take it then. And bang, he's groomed to Captain Jeffries, an officer, a gentleman, a member of the connected upper class. So it's not difficult to see why Edgar thinks joining the Territorials is a good networking opportunity, and he sees it as just that. He's not really interested in soldiering. He left home for one reason. Australia, and I thought, well, getting away from home, I would mix in with different people, and such as that, it would be a good act. And then I joined the Territorials for that self and same purpose. Captain Jeffries, though, is a serious soldier who proves a real hero. Serious and meticulous, uh, Edgar's excused all parade, but he still has to work hard and to Jeffries' high military standards. Every morning, Captain Jeffries inspects the condition of his horses by taking a white kid glove and stroking it along the animal's flank. Ah, every morning, come down like that, see if there's any, any dirt to see if he's properly go. Oh, yes. And is Edgar ever caught out? Are his horses ever dirty? No, I'm all going to say, because I've been used to horses, understand, grooming and that, seeing me, holding me things. No, I never had any report from me. It's very good. And that's not to say that everything goes smoothly for our groom extraordinaire. One day, riding through town on a particularly large horse, a tram spooks the animal. It rears up, kicking so wildly it falls over backwards, sending Edgar sprawling to the ground. He manages to hold onto the reins, scramble to his feet and stop the horse from bolting. A policeman runs over and says, What are you going to do now? I says, Ride the bugger. What do you think I'm going to do? I was that mad. Ride the bugger. What do you think I'm going to do? He screams at a policeman. He's that mad. But he gets back on that horse and rides it down over the high level crossing and back to the barracks. Now, does this incident shake Edgar's confidence or make him question his passion? Not one bit. Well, I've been used to horses all my life, as I told you. That's what made me want to go to Australia. I want to fancy being out on the ranches, you know. Because they were coming. Changed life altogether. Now, how the First World War actually starts is something we should quickly look at. Most folk would say it's because the Austro-Hungarian Archduke Franz Ferdinand gets shot by Serbian terrorists, or freedom fighters. Now, while that's true, it doesn't in of itself explain how everyone else gets involved. The problem is, the more you pull this particular thread, the more complicated and absurd things become as I shall quickly demonstrate. It actually all starts in 1892, three years before Edgar's even born, when Schlieffen, a German bloke, comes up with a war plan. You could argue it's a preemptive strike plan. He says that Germany can only win a European war if it throws all of its men west into France, wins, then throws them all back east into France's ally Russia. Schlieffen figures Germany will lose if they try and fight on both fronts at once, and the Russians are strong, but well a bit slow in getting going, so by knocking France out before anyone's noticed, the Germans can have their full force back east by the time the Russians have figured out where to begin. Now, he comes up with this plan in 1892, and then he dies. Now, the war begins in Bosnia which used to belong to Turkey, the Ottoman Empire, but became part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire at the end of the 19th century. Unfortunately, a group of Bosnians regard themselves as being part of Serbia instead, and aren't entirely happy with their status as effectively a bargaining chip between empires. So Serbia sponsors a group of ambitious Bosnian terrorists, or freedom fighters, to assassinate the Archduke. June the 28th, 1914, the assassination goes wrong. The one bomb lobbed at the Duke's motorcade goes off under the wrong car and chaos ensues. One terrorist, or freedom fighter, manages to escape and is hiding in a cafe trying to figure out what to do next when who should pull up right outside but the Archduke himself, who is only there because his driver didn't get the memo about changing the planned route. Three shots later, the Archduke and his wife are dead. Austro-Hungary is threatened, outraged, insulted, blames Serbia, and encouraged by their German neighbours, assert their empire's superiority and send Serbia an ultimatum. But they don't want a war. Their army couldn't attack anybody for weeks. It's a diplomatic move to humiliate the Serbs. 
Unfortunately, Russia doesn't want Serbia or any of her friends in the Balkans to suffer a humiliation, nor does she wish to look weak to Austro-Hungary and Germany, so Mother Russia mobilise army. Not to invade anyone, just to discourage any attack on Serbia. Now hold on tight, because here's where it gets bumpy. The problem is the Russians know that if they only send troops down to Serbia, the Germans can attack them and they will be defenceless. So they mobilize against Germany as well. Not to invade, remember, just to make them scheiser their lederhosen. Now, this diplomacy takes about a month. July 30th, 1914. So the Germans are sat there quite happily watching Austro-Hungary try and boss Serbia around when from out of nowhere, the Russians have mobilized against them. And they really didn't see that coming. So they fish in their files marked what to do in the event of a war, and discover a 20-year-old war plan. The Schlieffen plan. Is the fatherland in danger? Yeah. From who? Russia. The answer, quick, attack France. But France's border is well defended against Germany. However, sneaky Papa Schlieffen has planned for them to tramp through backdoor Belgium to outflank the French and plough towards Paris. Now, that's where we come in. Great Britain gets in a state of moral outrage that Germany should pick on our friends in poor defenceless Belgium. And so we declare war. By we, of course, I mean the British Empire. The declaration is binding on all dominions within the empire, including Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India, South Africa, and so we go to France to stop the Germans, and that's where we all dig in. There's Britain, France, Belgium, Holland, John Paul, George, Ringo, Luxembourg, and Germany. Austro-Hungary, meanwhile, is watching all of this, getting really quite confused. They aren't the sharpest bayonets in the rack. They eventually figure out their bluff ultimatum to Serbia to hand over all Bosnian terrorists or freedom fighters has started a war. So they figure, in for a penny, in for a pound, and attack Serbia anyway. August the 11th, 1914, they roll over the Danube. A month later, they roll back again, but that's another story. Soon enough, the Turks, Ottomans join in, then the Italians on the side with the bigger bribe, ours. The Bulgarians, somewhere along the line, we've got this whole gig with Peter O'Toole and the Arabs. We go into Basra, Baghdad, that whole area. But back then, it's to help the Arabs get rid of the Turks, Ottomans. And at some point, the Americans turn up, late as usual. And so the whole mess spirals way out of control. The reason the war ends, though, is much simpler. Germany runs out of men. So when war does break out, it's not difficult to see why it comes of something as a surprise to Edgar and the rest of his battalion. I mean, one minute they're just a bunch of part-time soldiers picking up some extra cash, making new friends. The next, they're called up. And they're full-time soldiers now for the duration of the war. But not to worry, because they'll only be used for home defence, and the war will most likely be over in a jiffy. But as the months roll on, and the casualties among the regular soldiers mount, the plans for the Terriers change drastically. But the Germans got on top of us, our regular soldiers. And they were winning the war, and we were rushed out into the gap to stop it, and we did. And that's what we done. Okay, it's the end of March, and Edgar and the rest of the 50th Northumbrian Division are sitting in Gateshead, waiting to be told they're off to France. Now, a division consists of three brigades. Each brigade is divided into four battalions of around about a thousand men each with each battalion broken into four companies named A, B, C, and D of around 220 men each, with each company broken into four platoons. So we know Edgar was in B Company of the 6th Battalion of the 151st Durham Light Infantry Brigade of the 50th Northumbrian Division. Simple. B Company, the boys in our company, were as honest as they was light. In charge of the 6th Battalion is Lieutenant Colonel H.C. Watson. And I remember Colonel Watson. And we've got Captain J.W. Jeffries as the adjutant or second in command. Man with the kid glove. Captain Jeffries was a hero. And uh, another little officer, I think it was a major, but I think he was a doctor. Conroy, some name like that. Major W.M. McKay is the M.O. or medical officer. Then in charge of A Company, we've got Captain... 
Captain A.P. Cummings. Major Cummings of Bishop Auckland. Major S.E. Badcock in charge of B Company. That's Edgar. B Company. Captain W.H.D. Davy in charge of C. And Captain J. Townend in charge of D. They set off for France and arrive at Boulogne. Upon landing, they hear that the Germans have launched a surprise attack on the city of Ypres using a terrifying new weapon shattering the British front line. So orders are given to march immediately for Steenvoord. But that's about 10 miles, I believe, from uh, Ypres. The 23rd of April 1915, the whole of the 151st Infantry Brigade is assembled in a field at the eastern end of the town. And remember, we're talking about something like 4,000 guys, so this isn't someone's back garden. And then the order was to pull into a big field on the left side of the road. And we pulled in and stacked our rifles and everything. They stacked their rifles and for the remainder of the day the men are allowed to rest. But in the evening, as it gets dark, the 6th and the 8th battalions proceed, believe it or not, by buses. The next thing, we were transported up to a town, uh, well, it was like Pont Island, Pont something. Through Popering to Vlamating, round about here. 24th of April, the day is spent testing rifles and making final preparations for action. Whilst trying to get their heads around the fact that it's an unscheduled six months into the war, the Allies have lost something in the region of a million men, and over half the British expeditionary force is either incapacitated or dead. Now, what do you do with those thoughts? Well, personally, I think I'd try and concentrate on something else. Food? And then when we got back, well, we got our Dixie spoon of stewed meat and such as that and vegetables. And we just nicely got it. Oh, mm, stewed meat and vegetables. When suddenly, there it comes. Everybody fall in! No exemptions this time. Grooms, Batman, Cooks, anyone with a Lee Enfield rifle. If your unit is going in to fight, you've got to be there with them. Everybody had to go. You weren't priv there was no privilege then. And within half an hour, the battalion is marching on the road towards Ypres. They enter the city as night is settling in. Ypres, the ruined, shattered nightmare we've all seen in photographs. No, standing, lovely, everything. The cloth hall standing on the left there, lovely building, lovely painted windows, like church windows. But as the battalion passes the cloth hall, a shell screams overhead and hits a building not too far away. Now, most of these guys are miners, so they're not bothered by explosions. But until then, there had been no talking in the ranks, nor any sound except for the beat of ammunition boots on the Pave Road. But when that shell hits, it is reported that ejaculation in the good old Durham tongue could be heard passing cheerily up the length of the column. A few more shells pass overhead, but luckily none burst near the battalion. And then on this right-hand side of here was the big cathedral. And then, of course, there was other buildings around. We marched right across the square and through and up to what they call the White Tower. And we got up this White Tower and went into the wood. And in that wood there was trenches. So they pass the White Chateau, or White Chateau, here, go into the wood and file into the trenches of the GHQ line. Now, the position of the 6th Companies are as follows. Captain Cummings A Company on the south side of the Pochisa Road, Cummings Cuties here, and everyone else on the north side. B Company on the right, the Badcock Boys here, C Company on the left, Davies Darlings over here, and D Company in the centre, Townend's Tykes here. Sunday the 25th of April 1915 is the first day that the 6th Battalion Durham Light Infantry spend in the trenches, and they lose no one through injury or death on that first day. In the evening, as it gets dark, the battalion leaves the trench and marches to Valerenhoek village, which for now still looks like Valerenhoek village. Now at this point, they come under the orders of the 85th division, who look after this-ish area, okay? And the sun hasn't even come up before the brigadier of the 85th is issuing orders to his new reinforcements. The 6th Battalion of the 151st Durham Light Infantry Brigade is to vacate the village and move a few hundred yards up the road to the east. Here the companies will leave the road and the men will improve with their entrenching tools, the available cover, and lay down. Now, through all of this, Edgar and the boys are in marching order with full packs. 
So you're getting no leniency on drills, and you've got something that weighs the equivalent of yourself on your back all day. The 26th. Before dawn, the Germans renew their offensive, making repeated efforts to break in at the gaps between various detachments on a shattered front line. One section is shelled so severely that its officers destroy all papers and maps and prepare for a last stand. At 10am, orders are issued to the company commanders, verbally, by Captain Jeffries. The Germans have broken through our lines and are advancing southwest. The company is to occupy the line between Hill 37, which can be seen on the left front, and Zona Baker Crossing, which lies on the road. Captain Cummings' A Company will march on the crossing, Captain Townend's D Company on Hill 37. And Major Badcock's B Company, that's Edgar, and Captain Davies' company will divide the space between. Advance in artillery formation, make good use of the cover afforded by the ground, and each of the company commanders should occupy one of his rear platoons. Well, it was like an old trench, but it was the railway line that we had to take. When companies have recaptured the railway and gained suitable positions on this line, they are to deploy and attack by fire any bodies of the enemy who might attempt to cross their front. Now, the only problem with this seemingly well-planned plan is that the entire thing is being watched by enemy balloons and the Germans deploy their newest, deadliest weapon, chlorine gas. Then the word come along that we had to urinate, urinate into a tin. And we had to dip our handkerchiefs, which were red issues then, in the handkerchief, wring them out, fold them and put them over our mouth and turn back about it. Now, the urea in urine does kind of help counteract the gas. It's a brilliant makeshift defence against a brand new weapon. But I imagine tying a piss-soaked rag to your face is not exactly the morale booster you need before heading into battle. And I no sooner got that done than the order come out, advance in extended order. But as soon as they go over the top, the enemy balloons spot them and an intense barrage is put down and all hell breaks loose. Captain Jeffries appears on his best horse, called confusingly enough Captain, and gallops apace on this now literally fire-footed steed right through the middle of the barrage to help them find Zonabaker Crossing. Captain Jeffries was there on his horse and uh, then he got off his horse. And he led us up. Having shown it to the companies on the right flank, he then proceeded along the line where he finds the platoon of D Company under 2nd Lieutenant Lyon digging themselves in. A bit further along, he finds another platoon and in the middle of showing them which way is up, he is, according to regimental documents, heavily fired on. Now, all I'll say is knowing the British Army's penchant for understatement, where a gaping wound is a mere scratch, or being completely surrounded is a bit of a tight spot, if they say he is heavily fired on, it must have been about as bad as it can get. But that doesn't appear to bother Jeffries, as he returns to Brigade Headquarters for a fresh horse and goes on to Hill 37, where he manages to find some guys from the London Rifle Brigade, who are about the only people who can tell him where the hell the rest of D Company are. Now, what are Edgar and B Company up to? I was actually mine with my rifle at the guard on the guard and advancing all the way. I was attaching bayonet with my rifle at the on the guard and advancing all the way. He's attaching his bayonet, an obvious signal that the men can expect some very close quarters combat. Any enemy machine guns? Any enemy contact? I can't remember being fired on. No, I can't remember being fired on. B Company on the right suffer very few casualties and reach Zonabaker Crossing in safety. But this is obviously some comparatively merciful pocket because everyone else gets the full effect of the barrage. Which includes, of course, gas. The gas was the worst trouble, see? The advance loses all direction towards the left, Captain Davy is wounded, and Major Badcock killed. Now, because of this so-called loss of direction, there's a whacking great gap right in the middle of the advance. So A Company are pushed forward to fill it. Cummings cuties get the job. And despite heavy casualties, the line is maintained, and they're still pushing forward, firing all the time on the enemy, because now they can actually see them. It's not till they have advanced a considerable distance that they discover there is another line of British troops 
troops right in front of them, holding out in shell holes and ditches. Where did you guys come from? We've been shooting at you for ages. Where the hell have you been? We've been holding out here for two days. Now, this is where the story really melts the brain. When this is discovered, number 11 platoon and part of number 9 platoon join the London Rifle Brigade, number 10 platoon join a battalion of the Shropshire Light Infantry, and the rest of number 9 platoon take up a position in charge of the hill. So by now, we've got Cummings Cuties and Townend's Tykes up front. As already described, A Company have pushed forward to fill the gap between B and C Companies, and a few Tykes have broken off and are trying to help out the now headless darlings. So as a result, we've got all the men of all companies all mixed together, and no no one knows what the hell is going on. <sighs> Having said that though, by dusk all formed parties have got in touch with battalion headquarters. BHQ, right here, Zevenkut Barn beside Zonabaker level crossing. I'll tell you something, we had nothing but our hammersack rations and our water bottle for them. For three days, we had to relieve our name. The counter-attack now complete, the job of holding the ground begins. On the night of the 27th of April, it is reported that the left of B Company, Edgar's Company, are in very close touch with the enemy. This means they're in the same trench, separated by a blockage only 10 yards wide, and they're stuck there for five days during which they're only resupplied with ammunition once, with a case of rifle grenades. They use rifle grenades on an enemy that may have only been ten yards away. I'll tell you something. We had nothing but our haversack rations and our water bottle full. For three days we had to relieve our name. On the second night, the night of the 28th of April, a platoon is sent to join the company, but... It was found that they could not be accommodated in the trench. There just isn't room for the men fighting, the men dying, and all of their gear to be in the same hole in the ground when you've got artillery fire from three sides, rifle fire from everywhere, not to mention an enemy in the same trench ten yards away on your left. So, the relief platoon turned back. Now, according to military records and the Department of the Bloody Obvious, all through this period the company was existing under very difficult conditions. See what I mean by understatement. I'll tell you something. We had nothing but our haversack rations and our water bottle full. For three days we had to relieve our name. The only time rations actually reached the company in this whole period is that same night, the 28th. And these ration packs do not include any drinks, so water was collected in empty ammunition boxes from shell holes strewn with body parts. Now, it's important to remember that when I use the term Rations. I am rationing with them biscuits, big square biscuits. I don't know what they were made on, but they were very, very substantial. Like when you got one, you know, you could feel it give you power and such that stopped your hunger. Oh, they were good biscuits, like, but that's all you had. A few biscuits and a tin of gory puddle water, and see you in three days. But in the end, the line holds, and the German attacks are stopped. Despite the loss of direction, the lack of ammunition, and a whole heck of a lot of gas. Well, I don't know a lot of gas. I mean, I, I lived through it, but there, there's a body that seems if they either didn't live or they, or they got felled by it. Because after we'd been in there five days, we got relieved. And when we got back to brigade headquarters, the other side of the uh, apes, there was only 200 of us answered roll call. I'm one of them that answered roll call. So I can't tell you what happened to because, I mean, we were full strength. There was born a lot of men, you know. I wouldn't like to estimate, but six or seven hundred men was lost. Either by either gassed or fell, and I don't know if a lot of them was killed, I couldn't say. In five days, they've gone from a thousand to only two hundred. After what must have been a crushingly painful roll call, Jeffries sends Edgar out through Ypres again to look for his horse, Captain, the one he'd been riding during the advance. And Edgar searches all of that day, but he feels more than a bit nervous doing it too, because... Because there was guns roaring and, and shells and all sorts like, but I done it. But it's no good. Captain the horse isn't anywhere to be found, so Edgar trudges back. Only to discover that while he's been out dodging shells and risking his neck, 
The horse had come back on his own. The horse had come back on his own. Edgar and Captain the Horse then become quite the team. He's a messenger rider, so day after day, week after week, he and Captain race from Brigade Headquarters through Eep to St. Julian, deliver messages, pick up replies, and then race back again. All the while, intense shelling and fires rage around them. Now, before we go any further, I have another story about that horse. When I was discharged out of the army in April 1919, I was home here, children, three Dent Street living. And as I went out one morning, I come out the top of Arbuck Street and I see an oil cart standing with a horse in it. And I look at that horse. And I said, I know him. And the man just turned, he said, I don't think you did. He said, I bought him out of the army. Will you wait here a minute or two? I nipped back, far and far, to the house. And I said to my wife, he says, Give us half a dozen of them sugar candies, them square lumps. And I went to my jacket and I got a photo that I just said to you I lost. I got that photo out of my wallet. And I went back. I gave the man the photo and I come and I stood two yards in front of the horse and I says, Captain! Captain. And he come forward and took them sugar lumps out of my hand. The man was flamagasted. I said, yes. I said, I've that I said, I rode that off. I said, I'll rode him when he's had his hair singed with the heat and flame in japes. And my tunic had been scorched with the flame. I saw apes this this show to the ground. Yes, I've rode him. I've rode him when he's had his hair singed with the heat and flame in Eep. My tunic had been scorched with the flames. I saw Eep disappear. Shelled to the ground. This is one of a handful of times that he talks explicitly about the danger. And every time he does, he arrives there from an oblique angle, an unrelated question. He's led there by his own memories. When asked specifically, he dodges the details, but when asked about peripheral topics and allowed to talk, he inadvertently wanders into revealing some of the horror behind the mask, but then immediately pulls back, unwilling or unable to confront the memories. I've rode him when he's had his hair singed with the heat and flame in Eep, and my tunic had been scorched with the flames. I saw Eep disappear, shelled to the ground. I've tried to imagine it, but every time I do, it's in full cinema mode. I'm imagining the spectacle, not the reality. I'm unconsciously glorifying what must have been utterly terrifying. And maybe those old soldiers, the ones who held their tongues for decades after the war, maybe they understood this. Maybe they knew that the scale, the magnitude of destruction would seem appealing to some. And that as they told their stories, they would become, well, just that, stories, romanticized instead of a warning, instead of the truth. In words written 2,400 years ago, war is sweet to those who have no experience of it. But the experienced man trembles exceedingly at heart on its approach. Throughout the entire interview, Edgar always asserts that he doesn't remember being fired on. In fact, the only thing he does say about the entire Eat Profensive is... I'll tell you something, we had nothing but our haversack rations and our water bottles full for three days and we had to rely on them. But the military records tell a vastly different story. I asked my nan if she'd ever talked to him about it. She said she had, but he clammed up pretty quick. She keeps pushing because she thinks his now legendary temper might be as a result of his experiences. She said she was prepared for him to scream and shout, but that didn't happen. Instead, he just started to cry. In Nan's words, he just fell to bits. So she backs off and never asks again. You see, it's not that I think Edgar's lying. I just think he's choosing not to remember. He's choosing to focus on more positive things, like 
food and horses. The 6th Battalion lick their wounds and replace their losses with the fragments of other battalions nearly wiped out at Ypres. They march up and down between St. Julian and Armitiers, which is about 12 miles south, just holding the line, getting cold, getting shelled. Jeffries is promoted to Lieutenant Colonel, and Edgar stays as his groom until Jeffries has a bit of an argument with a piece of shrapnel during another gas attack. He's okay, but he's out for six months, so without a boss, Edgar's transferred into transport. And he doesn't like it. His new CEO keeps on sending him on errands and isn't entirely pleasant about it either. Huggins, come here. Huggins, do that. Huggins, go there. And I know what to look after, and I thought, well, I'm not going to have this. I think he knows his own temper, and he can see himself beating seven shades of stink out of this transport officer character, and rather than get shot for something quite so petty, he asks for help. Captain Cook, sir, I tell you what, I, I don't like it in transport. Well, you could uh, come back into the line, Huggins. Here, yeah, I want my lackey back on transport. Well, uh, I'm sorry, you can't have him. He's part of W Company now, and uh, he's not your lackey. He's a lance corporal on my ration party, so bugger off. And Cook gives Edgar a promotion, just like that. He gets himself transferred back into the front line just because he doesn't like his new job. He always tries to remain upbeat, like things aren't all that bad. And most of the little factoids I learn at school about trench life don't seem to make an appearance. Trenchfoot. Do you suffer from trenchfoot in the trenches? No, I can't. Uh, I can't recollect much time I was in the trenches. I remember like a bit cold. Of course, I got frozen ears, understand? A bit cold. 1915 is the worst winter on record. Are you issued sheepskin jackets, anything like that? No, no, no. What about lice in the seams of your shirt? You must have burned them with matches. No, 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 no. You kept your match to have a smoke. Well, what about the men? Did anyone get ratty with each other? Any bust-ups? No, no. I, I don't, can't remember any quarrel among them. Uh, do you see any high-ranking officers? Do they ever visit? No, I never see no. No. No, it's a man where... And ever I see with our colonel. Well, doesn't it bother the men that there are these high-ranking officers that never see you, but are issuing all these wonderful plans to go out and kill Germans? No, I don't think uh, I know. No, I don't think I've affected anybody. Do you gamble? Oh, no, 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 no gambling. Well, do you have any opportunity to meet French people? Why, uh, <laughs> no, I don't say they had. Uh, how do you go to the toilet? Why, well, you just start to... Do it where you, when you want it, where you could. <laughs> so you don't have a particular area, you just... You just have a shine and dust away. <laughs> that broad soldier, I hope it's not on there. Oh, it's on there. You just have a shite and toss it away. That's called soldiering. You don't read that in textbooks. But every now and again, one of the old favourites does rear its ugly head. Uh, one of my men um, went off his jump leg. Lost his nerve, you know, got him beat. Edgar and the boys are going through quite a lot of shell fire and one of his men goes off his jump like. Lost his nerves, you know, got him beat. In other words, loses his mind to shell shock. He went to uh, what we call crackers like mud. We had to give him a bump to quiet him down, but of course, uh, as soon as we got him to them, oh, and uh, he was taken away with the light. Straight away down, I don't know what happened to him. I spent him all, lad. Oh dear. Yeah. I lost his, his mind, went and went proper crackers. Yeah. Sad job when they get. Although, really, the truth is, the men stood up very, very well, I think. Yeah, they stood up very well. Shell shock is also known as bullet wind, soldier's heart, battle fatigue, operational exhaustion. Remember that last one. Operational exhaustion. For a while, Edgar finds himself out on patrol quite a bit, but when we ask if he has any scrapes out in no man's land, he says... Oh, no. I never saw any. No, I never saw any. No, I mean, I've not seen Germans, you know. Been everyone on the prowl, same as me, but I didn't go and ask them to shake hands. 
Oh, no, I didn't do them surveys. So we know he never sought any trouble, but we know that plenty sought him. I mean, you can go out with a, a working party, for instance. There was, say, 50 men. You're not trying to come back with 50. You can be a, a great cracker. Shell fire come over, trap them, and there can be three or four of them wounded. And did the enemy ever let you get the wounded back in? It depends who they were. That's where they were. What do you mean? I can give you a little example of what they're like. When uh, we were up at Armateurs, the German trench was about 200 yards down in front of us. And when the troops got in, the enemy put a stick and a white flag up. And the word come over, you know fire, we know fire. But who was in them trenches? Well, the Saxons. That's who were in. And they were there for that fortnight. No shots being fired, no shell fire, no nothing. So the Saxon units are of a similar mind to you when you're out on patrol and see Germans. I leave you be, you leave me be. Figures. The Saxon units are the ones responsible for the famous Christmas truce in 1914. One even approaches the British line shouting, We are Saxon, you are Anglo-Saxon, what is there for us to fight about? But I got relieved with the Prussian guards. Well, then that was a different question altogether. I couldn't resist firing and shelling. Constant. The Prussian guard are an elite fighting unit, professional soldiers all, so no wonder they feel the need to keep up appearances. No. If anybody was lame when there were Saxons there, yeah, you'd go out and you could get back in again. <laughs> the Prussian guard you, didn't you know? Oh no, I took a delight in supper of you. <laughs> yes. They took a delight in the suffering of you. Do you get any religious council, church services, either in the trenches or on reserve back in the wood? None in the trenches, Denry. And, uh, just likewise, I mean, for although you were back in a wood, you were being shelled, you know. It wasn't quiet and peace altogether. There's a bunny lot of my soldiers got lamed through shrapnel, you know. I once saw a sergeant had his head taken off a lump of shrapnel. Cut straight off. And he walked about 12 yards before he fell. Aye, uh, yes. Spanny more sergeant. Aye. Uh, how do you deal with scenes like that? Well, I don't know. I think it's just... Well, I... Become second nature, I think. That's all I can say about it. Second nature. A man's head being taken off becomes... second nature. Edgar gets wounded. He uh, gets blood poisoning and has to be shipped off to hospital in Boulogne to recuperate. How does he get wounded? How does he get blood poisoning? He cuts his hand with a jackknife trying to open a tin of butter. <laughs> a small wound, but one that could have been fatal. If the authorities suspect you are deliberately injuring yourself, it's up against the wall for the firing squad. After a pleasant few weeks in Boulogne learning to swim, Edgar returns to find he's been made sergeant in charge of a platoon. However, Two new recruits in Edgar's platoon start giving him trouble. Well, I don't know. I, I seem as, as if I didn't like to be told what to do. Uh, I wanted to do what I thought. But instead of reporting these lads to Captain Cook, as he should have done, it seems Edgar's famous temper gets the better of him and... So I sat there and I give him a damn good item. Because at that time I was handling the gloves a bit. And I was also doing a bit of wrestling. So I sat down and gave him a damn good hiding. I've only lost my stripes though in mine. But uh, the captain, Captain Cook it was, he uh, he ignored it. But I could have lost my stripes, though I think. But I sat down and, uh, and that was settled him and uh, it settled the other lad. No, I had no trouble. No trouble after that. Still, if I'd just spent over a year on the Western Front watching friends and comrades die and two newbies started giving me lip, might do the same thing. But perhaps another reason that Captain Cook looks the other way is that he knows that the battalion will soon need battle-proved professional soldiers, as Edgar now is, because another offensive is on the way. 
The beginning of March 1916, the sixth move to the Somme front. Zero hour for their offensive in the Second Battle of the Somme will be midnight on the 15th of September. The attack is to be made in four waves, with the 9th Durham Light Infantry on the right, the 6th in the centre, that's Edgar, and the 5th Border Regiment on the left. W Company, under Captain J. Cook, that's Edgar, will be on the left of the first wave. But in this battle, it will be the Allies who have a secret new weapon, and the boys of the 6th are going in behind tanks. At uh, 5 minutes to 12 that night, the tanks went over. And at 12 o'clock, we went over. We stumble on and stumble on through the dark. The right-hand side of the attack is taken most of the fire, and we continue to advance. About five hours into the attack, just breaking daylight, Captain Cook shouts, I'm exhausted, I'm done, and drops to the ground. I realise in a flash I need to do something, so I give the order. Halt! Dig in! And the men take cover. We're only a few yards in front of Captain Cook, and I'm going to try and get back to him to find out what to do when I notice a figure coming towards me. So I challenge, Halt! Who goes there? Friend, advance friend and be recognised. I keep my rifle on him. It's Colonel Jeffries. <laughs> Sergeant Huggins, what's the position? <sighs> Captain Cook is down, sir. He's uh, exhausted. <sighs> he says he can't. There isn't another officer. So what I've done is I've called a halt and got the men to dig in. And I was going to go back to Captain to find out what to do. <sighs> You get the men to fall in, in two lines. I'll take the first, you take the second and follow me in. The objective is some trenches further on and they've got to be taken. So I uh, turns around, get the men to fall in and set off. Never letting Colonel Jeffries get too far away so as not to get lost. Now again, Edgar asserts. As I say, there was no trouble, no opposition. As I, I think the tanks have done a good job for us, you see. But the military records state that the battalion is completely checked by machine gun fire. Is he misremembering? Is it on purpose? Either way, once they reach the enemy trench, Jeffries tells Edgar to put some men on lookout and wait for him to come back. Then Colonel Jeffries disappears again. Where Colonel Jeffries went, I do not know, because I never saw him after that. But Captain Coker eventually, getting himself worked up from where he laid, and he was just outside the trenches. So I'll go back to check on Captain Cook. Captain, what do you want to do, sir? Sergeant Huggins, huh? What are those trenches over there? I don't know, sir. I haven't been over there. So I goes over to the trenches. Cook's pointed out to see what's what. I climb the outer bank. I'm just about to drop in the trench when... Me corporal, Albert Cop, saw me fall. And he come running up and jumped in. And uh, he says, we'll get you back. And he took me back. Uh, and then anyway, I got over and he helped me over. And uh, when I got there... I just sit down and I don't remember anymore. Next thing I remember, I was in a bed in a hospital in Boulogne. 21-year-old male presents as an acute trauma rifle wound to the abdomen. The patient had been stood hunched over at 90 degrees to the line of fire when he sustained a bullet wound to the abdomen from... Was it a sniper? No, there you are. I don't know who got me or when I got shot. But uh, it must have been a sniper. From a sniper rifle. He was conscious on arrival at the field hospital, but in shock. The bullet entered just above the right iliac crest, creating a one-inch entry wound, traversed the superficial abdominal tissues, creating a large area of cavitation and extensive soft tissue loss. Bullet went in this side, and out this side, blew this left side out. He underwent emergency surgery, and at laparotomy it was discovered he had fortunately not received any visceral injuries. You know, you're a lucky chap. If you'd not been hunched over, if that sniper had got you seconds earlier while you were stood up, that bullet would have blown your spine out, killing you on the spot. You've been awarded a medal, haven't you? Yes, military medal. Uh, presented to me by a, a brigadier or a general from in the front of the big town hall that was where the big pillars were up on the, on the square. That's where I got my medal presented to me, the military medal. And do they tell you why you get it? Well, I got it through, yeah, through the Somme battle. No, I have no doubt about that. That's what I got it for, for ta taking charge and leading men. But uh, it's not for me to say what I got it for. <laughs> I, I don't like doing them sort of things. I mean, leave that other people to do. That's their point, not mine. I've done my duty. And that's all I know about that. 
Edgar recovers, but he never goes back to the front. He spends the rest of his war transporting military prisoners and training new recruits. Amazingly, the reason doctors don't deem him fit for active service is not the rifle shot through his guts. It's the fact he can no longer crook his trigger finger properly due to his injury with the jackknife and the tin of butter. Years after the war, Edgar's driving down the road into town when he notices a man pushing a wheelbarrow along the roadside. As he gets closer, he recognises the man, so he slows down, pulls over and jumps out. And I says, uh, is that Albert Cap? And he looked up and he says, that's Edgar Hogan's. Albert Cap is the corporal who pulls Edgar out of the trench after he's been shot and gets him back to the dressing station, the man who saves his life. And in Edgar's words, they have a canny good chat before parting ways. I like to imagine much happier now each knows the other has made it because of other friends from Edgar's wartime. That's the about the only lad I met because all the lads that I was were all killed. After Edgar's sent home, the 6th Battalion have a hard rest of the war and are all but wiped out and officially disbanded. As often seems the case with war, there's a terrible irony at work. If that enemy sniper had not tried to kill Edgar, he'd probably be dead. After the war, the focus is all on the glorious dead. There's the cenotaph and the unknown warrior, and everyone seems to get the same idea that the cream of the generation, the very best of the best, have all gone. But sometimes I feel that leaves Edgar and the rest of the survivors who walked between the crosses to infer the other side of that assumption that they're somehow less than those that didn't make it. And the guilt of being alive and the wish to preserve that good opinion of their fallen comrades keeps them silent. And while the war shouldn't define him, to hold his tongue for 75 years, it certainly left scars on both his body and his mind. And while I suppose surviving is its own reward, it also seems that being a survivor is a sentence. But that's the catch-22. Everyone at home wants to remember, but everyone coming home wants to forget. And in that dichotomy, we lose something, not just a modicum of mental well-being for those who fought, but also a true understanding of what it is that they went through. War is sweet to those who have no experience of it, but the experienced man trembles exceedingly at heart on its approach. So, thinking back to uh, Sunday lunch, uh, Edgar telling his stories, my piece of string, I'm glad he felt he could talk. I'm glad I didn't question, didn't poke and prod. I'm glad I just sat and listened. However, I'm also very glad that the Imperial War Museum thought to record those memories. And while Edgar never makes it to Australia, he does make it to the ripe old age of 96. When were you married? 1917, August the 8th, 1917. Uh, <laughs> now there's a case. My wife's father worked at, uh, on the council at the waterworks and it was a pay with a pound a week. And my wife was day girl at the gentleman's house down the railway and she got a food and five shillings a week. But she was looking after her father, because her mother was dead. And they were living in a house, and uh, six shillings a week went. I come, after I got home, I thought, well, I popped out the children. So I popped through and spent the weekend with them. And I'd done that a few times. And of course, I only was friends with her, but her and her sister she used to go to the dancing. Well, her sister liked dancing. But she wasn't a big dancer. And uh, then I come this week and said, Father had finished work, got on his pension. And I thought, well, that's a reduction. Which I will manage. 
And that they say to her, that ever fancy getting married? She just laughs. Well, she says, uh, I have thought about it, not just now. Well, I said, if you like to marry me, I can make your allowance. And we got engaged, got married, and I allowed her an allowance out of my pay to help her earn a father. And that's how I got married. That's how I proposed, just as I've said it. <laughs> and when did she die? Huh? When did your wife die? She died in uh, August the 11th, 1981. And when I tell them, and I'm suddenly going to tell them, that I'm a man whose wife one day you'll be, they'll never believe me, they'll never believe me, that from this great big world, you've chosen me. This beautiful song by Herbert Reynolds and Jerome Kern was instantly popular when it first appeared in 1914. And it remained popular at the front among the Tommies, who changed the words until it went something like this. And when they ask us how dangerous it was, oh, we'll never tell them, no, we'll never tell them. We spent our pay in some cafe and fought wild women night and day. Twas the cushiest job we ever had. And when they ask us, and they're suddenly going to ask us the reason why we didn't win the quad again. Oh, we'll never tell them, no, we'll never tell them. There was a front, but damned if we knew where. And when they ask us, and they're suddenly going to ask us the reason why we didn't win the quad again. Oh, we'll never tell them, no, we'll never tell them. There was a front, but damned if we knew.